Does the government, whether from DC, your state, or town, village, local city, have the ability to regulate where and how you can discharge a firearm? That's the question that's being resolved in Pennsylvania right now with, of course, some constitutional implications. Specifically, we're talking about a gentleman who thought he had retired to his idyllic five acre property in the mountains. It's beautiful. He built his dream range and he could start plinking safely according to law enforcement. The only problem, well, the neighbors. They didn't really care for it. Local government stepped in, changed the discharge of firearm rules, and now we're in court. Guys, let's get into it. So what are we talking about? Well, we're in the great state of Pennsylvania. We're talking about Mr. Jonathan Barris, who began to draw complaints about a year or so after he moved into his home in Pennsylvania back in 2009, and he installed a shooting range on his five acre property. Now, a law enforcement officer responding to a complaint said that the range had a safe backstop, but the targets were in line with a large box store at a nearby shopping center. And we don't know a lot of details about all this. So um, I just need to emphasize the fact there's not a huge amount of how was it built and what were the angles. You're gonna be asking me that. I don't know. Okay. Responding to complaints in 2011, the Stroud Township Board of Supervisors passed a, quote, discharge ordinance, end quote, restricting gunfire to indoor and outdoor gun ranges as long as they were issued zoning and occupancy permits. Code for you can't go in your backyard and shoot guns without involving the local government. It also said that guns couldn't be fired between dusk and dawn or within 100 feet of an occupied structure with exceptions for self-defense by farmers, by police, and indoor firing ranges. Now, Mr. Barris sought a zoning permit after he was warned he could face a fine as well as potential seizure of any firearms used to discharge in violation of the discharge ordinance. He was turned down for the zoning permit based, surprise, surprise, on the size of his lot, proximity to other homes, and the location outside the two permissible zoning areas for the ranges. A county judge ruled in favor of the township, but the Commonwealth Court in 2021 called the discharge ordinance unconstitutional, violating Mr. Barris's Second Amendment rights. In a 64-page ruling, linked in the description box below, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Stroud townships, in other words, against the gentleman, Mr. Barris, who was looking to discharge firearms. So what did the judges do and say exactly? In this case, the Supreme Court ruling appears to basically go towards the EZL, the E-Z-E-L-L, -L, for those of you on your, your lawnmowers, alternative pronounced, the EZL ruling, that we've basically mentioned a couple times before for very strict reading of the New York State Rifle State Pistol Association versus Bruin. That's the June of 2022 Bruin decision, where in the EZL in the Seventh Circuit Court found the right to possess firearms for protection implies a corresponding right to acquire and maintain proficiency in their use, adding, of course, that the core right, we're talking about the Second Amendment, Basically, the Second Amendment wouldn't mean much without the training and practice to make it effective. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court basically reasoned that this is actually overruled by the Bruin decision, which said, quote, in sum, in the years following Heller and McDonald, that's 2008, 2010, respectively, the federal courts of appeal coalesced around a two-step framework for analyzing Second Amendment challenges that combined history with means and scrutiny, end quote. That's from Bruin. Now, while many, if not most, of the challenges in those cases directly implicated the Second Amendment's core lawful purpose of self-defense, the Supreme Court in Heller noted at 630, not all did. Some of these challenges instead involved what could be described as being ancillary, corollary, subsidiary, implied, or corresponding rights. So we're talking about things, for instance, your right to purchase a firearm, your right to purchase ammunition, your right to travel with it, not necessarily bear or carry, but to travel, your right to practice, where can you buy, all those sorts of things are obviously wrapped up with the notion of you have a right to bear arms, but can those be loaded? Are you allowed to buy them? So it's more it's more complicated than just you have a right to bear arms. Do you have a right to purchase arms? You have a right to practice with firearms and so forth. That's kind of these ancillary or corollary or subsidiary or implied corresponding rights that we're kind of talking about here. That's where we're getting to. Now, in such cases, as in more straightforward core cases, courts found the first step of the two-part framework basically satisfied as saying, yep, this is protected by the Second Amendment. Now we need to go to step two, 
That is, until Brune. The court then ruled that Brune clarified, so this is the Pennsylvania court, that Brune clarified the standard by applying the Second Amendment is as follows. When the Second Amendment's plain text covers an individual's conduct, the Constitution presumptively protects that conduct. Accurate. The government must then justify its regulation by demonstrating that it is consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. I'm with you so far, Pennsylvania. Only then may a court conclude that the individual's conduct falls outside the Second Amendment's unqualified command. Okay, they can copy-paste from Bruin. <laughs> so far, so good. But I know this could go off the rails somewhere. We'll, we'll see. So then the Pennsylvania Supreme Court proceeded to basically lay out their argument that the strict regulation of firearm ranges is consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. And that, as a result, Mr. Barris's conduct, therefore, falls outside the Second Amendment's unqualified command. So basically, in conclusion, the court wrote, then we're going to get to the analysis, quote, We hold the Second Amendment's plain text covers Barris's conduct based on the specific terms of the discharge ordinance before us, which permits the confiscation of lawfully owned arms. Nonetheless, we further hold the government has met its burden to justify the discharge ordinance's shooting range exception by showing it is consistent with the nation's historical tradition of farm regulation. As such, Barris's conduct falls outside the Second Amendment's unqualified command, and the township's discharge ordinance is facially constitutional. We therefore reverse and remand, end quote. As you watch this video, guys, I want you to pay attention to the spectrum I'm going to set up here. And I want you to let me know in the comment field, where on that spectrum do you draw the line? Where do you stand? What ought the law be? And pay attention to the spillover its secondary and third order effects and consequences of all this that I'll be talking about in the video. By the way, hit that like button, subscribe to make sure you don't miss any of our future content. Now back to the video. So I think we have to acknowledge that this is a point where there's going to be lots of politics coming into it when and if government should be allowed to restrain the discharge of firearms in public outside of a shooting range or perhaps a hunting scenario. Just target practice or plain old plinking or no reason at all. I think at one end of the spectrum, and this is not me editorializing, this is just me explaining the landscape as I see it. At one end of the spectrum, you have folks who are going to say it should be absolutely legal provided that you're not violating anybody's rights. So you're not violating anyone's private property rights. You're not you're shooting entirely on your own property, the bullet's not leaving your property, you're not damaging anyone else's property, and you're not harming anyone else. And if you do any of those things, then great. You can be sued, it can be subject to criminal violations of the law, you name it. There's of course a nuisance effect, but of gunshots going off and all that kind of stuff. Uh, whether you subscribe to that being meaningful or whether you say this is why you should deregulate silencers or suppressors, Different conversation. I'm just kind of establishing this is this is one end of the spectrum that says as long as you're not harming anyone else, you should be allowed to do whatever, right? The other end of the spectrum is going to say government should absolutely be able to do everything, right? Government should be able to ban everyone from anything, or at least the, that government has the power to do so would, I think, be that position. Then there's going to be folks in the middle somewhere, and this is, again, this is this is a spectrum. It's not a binary, this or that. There's a spectrum. There's lots of gray who are going to say, look, if you're in a rural enough setting and you have a safe backstop and everything's okay, then yeah, you should be able to discharge firearms, whether it's a 22, a center fire, shotguns only, shotguns size six pellets or smaller, whatever else the case may be. That's all relative to the context of place and time, your surroundings, the community you're in and so forth, right? And again, I'm not espousing support for any of these positions. I'm just articulating these seem to be the positions that are out there. The question, though, is that as you now take the question of, all right, we've got this example of a gentleman in his backyard who wants to be able to shoot. Okay. He seems to be doing it in a safe manner. Fine. Five-acre property. Is that large or small? You be the judge. Apparently beyond it is a Best Buy or some sort of large box store. So maybe it's not as rural as one would perhaps otherwise normally think. But if you now start climbing this question, and rather than looking at horizontally as you've got these different perspectives on what ability and rights should government have or not have, or individuals have alone or reserved to them alone or not, you then have these questions as they stack up of, well, if government can deal with the discharge of firearms, and if they can regulate that, is that not regulating the Second Amendment? 
And if you concede, as folks maybe on this end of the spectrum can, your right, my left, that, yep, government does have the ability to do these things, you can immediately see the spillover effect into other areas of the Second Amendment. Well, if government has the intrinsic ability to regulate firearms, or at least firearm discharge, can they now regulate and really step into firearm sale? What about gun ranges? Hey, if you got one gun range estate, if you can drive six hours to fire a gun, isn't that good enough? So you can see how even though I don't know what kind of viewpoints you're going to have. I look forward to reading the comments as always. But you can see how this has second and third order effects on it. Now, there's a variety of laws out there that the municipality cited to because, again, under the second prong of the Bruin test, the township's legal team basically pulled examples from obscure local ordinances dating all the way back to the Civil War. And I don't mean our Civil War, I mean the English Civil War. We're talking 1642 through 1697, the antebellum uh, era in the United States, so pre-1860, even post-Civil War law books. So they cobbled together a sampling, but if you actually look at some of those, because keep in mind, Justice Clarence Thomas once, of course, famously remarked that not all history is created equal when we're talking about trying to surmise what history is part of our tradition. Should a 1642 ordinance that said it's unlawful to shoot on the Sabbath day. Is that necessarily the same as some guy who built a safe place in his backyard to plink? How relevant or not relevant is that? Or how about an 1836 ordinance that banned the discharging of firearms in the streets of Brooklyn, New York City? Or how about an 1817 New Orleans regulation on firing any gun, pistol, or fouling piece of firearm in any street, courtyard, lot, or walk or public way? Again, we get to this matter of degree, saying that, making arguments that, look, just because New York City regulated the discharge of firearms back in 1836, is that the same thing as a rural or semi-rural township for somebody who has safely built a backstop and all that kind of stuff? You be the judge on that. But this is the sort of strategy and this is the sort of pivots and reasoning to kind of smuggle in gun control through our history and tradition of saying, look... We banned firearms from being discharged in 1836 Brooklyn, and that kind of fundamentally gets to the fact that there were other people here and there were residences there, and we can abstract from that the principle that, oh, we can block discharge of firearms where there's people or residences, and that's close enough to here. And you can see how we start to smuggle in gun control through our history. As always, you be the judge. You tell me what you think about all this. Where do you think this is going to go? Is it going to wind up going to the Supreme Court? And I'm really interested to hear what is reasonable on that spectrum that I laid out and where would you draw the line? I look forward to joining the discussion in the comment field below. But before I leave you, let's go to our ever popular quote of the day. This one comes from controversial thinker and philosopher Ayn Rand. Quote, the question isn't who is going to let me, it's who is going to stop me. End quote. Hopefully by now you know that just because I pull a quote from someone doesn't necessarily mean that I love the whole body of their work. And I'm not saying that with respect to Miss Rand or not, just a friendly reminder on that subject right now. I'll see you all in the next one. Don't forget to hit that like button. Thanks and take care. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this one, please feel free to check out some of our other great content and we'll see you in the next one.